My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're talking about a good batch of comics here today. A pretty important batch of raw keys, I would call them. <laughs> what do you got, Jimmy, up front? All right. Up front is patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Uh, I post a lot of my zines, especially old stuff that's out of print. This is an example of something. If you sign up at my Patreon, you can download this PDF today. So patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Lots of artwork, lots of making of comics, lots of behind the scenes. I even put up uh, cartoonist kayfabe notes on occasion. So check it out. Super cool. I'm in a weird transitional period, Jimmy, because I think in about a week from uh, this recording, the press release for issue one of Red Room is going to go out, man. So Exciting I can't. Times. Yeah, so I can't say boom, it's out. What I can say is that I have a link tree that has my Patreon and all that stuff in the description below this video. It has the Patreon for the early adopters who want to read Red Room uh, before it hits print. And if you check that link tree uh, around January 20th, uh, you're going to be able to pre-order issue number one, man. So Red Room. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. This is the kind of stuff you're getting there, man, so I don't want to bury the lead. Anybody who's coming here for Carl Bark stuff, uh, you know, once you see this, you're going to know if that comic's for you or not. By the way, we will get to the Carl Barks at some point. Yeah. Hey, and, uh, and I'll still be pimping this shit, man. Yeah, keep so, that out so there for a minute, you. Ed. Uh, here's the other piece. Whenever this drops, I'm sure you'll be posting links, making the announcement known, spreading it far and wide. K Fabers, this is what this is what we're asking for. We give you free videos every day. When you see that announcement, share it, spread it, uh, you know, make it known that Red Room is is widely available and ready for pre order. When you see that news drop, that's goddamn right. So we're going to take a look at uh, Marvel Comics Presents issues twenty five through I believe ninety two, and uh, you could you could skin this cat many ways, man, and we are going to. But in this video, we're looking at the breakout success comics of Sam Keith. Yeah, we looked at his Hulk fill-in issue, which had come out before this, uh, Hulk 368, I believe. So you can find that video uh, on Cartoonist Kayfabe as well and look up some background. That put Keith on my radar. Yeah. This story immediately followed Barry Windsor Smith's Great Weapon X serial, and it's like, I liked Sam Keith. I was already in the habit of buying Marvel Comics Presents. Of course I'm going to pick this up. That's one of the baddest-ass Wolverine drawings of all time. It complete that's how you make a cover right there and announce that you are it check this out everybody. So uh it just took me from the get-go, you know, like I was excited to see more Sam Keith. Wolverine was my favorite character and this was one of the greatest interpretations of that character I'd ever seen. And following Barry Windsor Smith, this is like when the Hall of Fame quarterback retires and you and you get drafted to follow them. That's a tough tough order, man. And I think Sam Keith rose to that challenge. Sam Keith uh, did the first couple issues of Sandman. A lot of people will make note of that. But more often than not, people are going to that comic for the Neil Gaiman contribution. Uh, the Sam Keith part of that, he admits, doesn't move the needle as much, man. Uh, a lot of a lot of bubbas in the in the kitchen or whatever. It's a long way from this kind of drawing. <laughs> that that as well. Yeah, that too. Uh, so let's just let's just dive in, man. It's the cyber story. What's the name? Blood Hungry, written by Peter David. Uh, eight pages apiece. Originally, this was going to be Todd McFarlane. There's a comic scene like sidebar. You know, it's a Wolverine story article, and there are sketches by McFarlane for this Wolverine. I have no idea why that didn't come to pass. Um, we're going to see all kinds of really tour de force drawing in here, like cartoony stuff. You know, things that I think most Marvel house style artists probably couldn't do very well. McFarlane has some cartooniness, so it's kind of a funny what if, but Sam Keith, it feels like this story is built for him. Taking a look through this issue, uh, through these comics, the entire story, I started to just kind of make note of what I infer could be some of his, uh, his influences. And there's stuff in here that's, you know, pick the page. Here's a Richard Corbin image. Here's a Von Baudet image. There, there's even a little bit of Robert Crumb uh, body, body language in, in some of this stuff, man. Should we dive in? Yeah, let's get going. So with, so Sam Keith and Peter David, they have eight pages each issue to tell their story. Eight part story, eight issues, eight pages. And uh, you got to get a lot of story across, man, on, on each page. So when you see this, you might get a little nervous. That's a lot of panels. You, where's the anchor? <laughs> where's the anchor, Jimmy? Is it the boat at the top? That was something <laughs> that I overlooked previously, and I'm going through this. It's really neat to see his page layouts, because uh, I haven't heard him say that he hates the grid, but... Man, his page layouts are pretty inventive. It's all wild stuff. And uh, there, there's even, when it comes to influence, I even see, like, uh, heavy metal magazine, kind of, like, in general. 
there's Philippe Droulet uh, kind of layouts and stuff. He's He's got a lot of influences. He wears them on his sleeve, but he brings his own shit to the table, as you can tell right here. Yeah, draws that wolf really well. Uh, we're going to see a cat as well throughout this story. So the animals, the cartoony stuff, there's so much he does that's outside of that house style. And that's probably, I couldn't articulate that whenever I was you know, 14 or something and pick these up. But man, I look at it now and that's what jumps out to me is like, yeah, this stuff looks like no other, nothing else that was on the spinner rack. Totally. And I think that's, that's what attracted us, you know, like this is like an era where things are no longer looking like, you know, Ron Friends, Thor comics, or, or you know what I'm saying? No, Al Milgram ain't on the, ain't on the bill here. Yeah, his anatomy always impresses me, like draws massive muscles, yeah. uh, which is, you know, exactly what I wanted at that time. Perfect for the image era. You know, everybody's roided up. This piece feels a little mangy. Yeah. You know, there's a little something missing right there, man. He figures that out. <laughs> the anatomy is cartoon anatomy. Make no mistake. Oh, for sure. But it's almost like those drawings where the the artist will take like a cartoon character and then he'll draw the musculature underneath. That's right. almost a version of what Sam Keith does because the anatomy is so distorted to his version. Yeah, man, we have the little gimmick where Wolverine is uh, doing his hunting job and he just wants to touch the animal, but then a little wolf, an old crabby wolf comes by, kills his prey. He cuts off a little piece of that deer, hooks hooks the, uh, hooks the wolf up, and uh, that's going to come home to roost in the end. Look at yeah. that right there, just feral as hell. <laughs> you never see Wolverine being feral like that. In Madripoor, kind of a, looks like a bigger town than I realized. I always <laughs> picture this little... I don't know, you know, tiny nation in the middle of nowhere, but it looks like a met metropolis he's overlooking there. A lot of lights. I always marvel uh, at the artists who are able to to do this, man. I've tried it several times, and I've never I've never pulled it off in any significant way, but it's all it's perfect. Very reminiscent of uh, Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> this is another. This is a good spread to kind of point out the fact that there's so much black ink. Mm -hmm on uh, most of these pages that it creates this gray, like, you know, grit from this page is getting onto this page and vice versa. So, like, even as a kid, I remember feeling like this is, this is a dirty comic, man. And it's by virtue of the, the manic line work that Sam Keith is putting down on the page, like this flexographic printing technology of the day, it, they did what they could with these thin lines, we'll say. It's worth noting when you mention how much ink is on these pages, like the gutters are so thin. You know, these are Chris Ware Acme Novelty Library gutters, uh, which again is atypical for a Marvel comic. You know, we're used to this kind of a, a gap in your in your gutters and it kind of opens up your page, lets it breathe, gives it some white. You don't see that here at all. You know, like this is a very thin, that white gutter is about the same width as the black gutters that are ruling the borders. Very tight. He's just trying to get as much story in there as possible. I mean, these are postage stamp sized panels. The the writing on this, Peter David, uh, it's all puns and yeah. Good, there, like, there's going to be ball. moments where you know uh, General Coy or whatever his name is, and the guy and he introduces himself as I'm Coy, and the other guy has to come back with I'm shy. And it's all that stuff. And there's every uh, page. Surely you're joking. Don't call me Shirley. That's in here. Like it's it's. <laughs> Every if you've page. read a lot of Peter David, the Peter Davidisms are on display in this story. <laughs> this is pretty. Uh, this is some pretty baller shit, man. Like he's he's like the strawberry. Like he's hanging out with the drug dealer lady. It's like he knows she is one he, of the crime bosses of Madripoor. There's two big crime bosses, and uh, Wolverine's literally in bed with one of them. Yeah, and she's she's his uh, Electra. Yeah, and uh, I, I don't know if that's the right analogy because he's also like her. I think she's manipulating him as much as anything else. I see. Yeah, whenever the drug deal is going to go down, she uh, makes sure that he's going to be there to, eh, in case she needs a little help. Right. How about that composition right there, man? Underneath the dock, right. as the boat approaches, we got our guy standing right on the edge. Uh, Bernie Wrightson is is an influence I, I see in uh, Sam sure. Keith's work. And this strikes me as a kind of a Bernie Wrightson sort of composition. You know, there was that Leviathan comic that he did, uh, writes and did in like creepy or eerie magazine that had some, some similar vibes to it. But, uh, this is the, uh, this is the introduction of, of cyber. Yeah. There's a lot here to, to pick at. 
One of them, you know, you mentioned all of the, uh, how, how dense the panels are. Mm -hmm. I think that's the mark of a young cartoonist. Sure. You know, you're a little bit insecure, so you want to show everything. The other thing that I see on this page is how empty it is. There at the docks, it's Madripoor is like a trading kind of place. You know, ships coming and going, get whatever you want here. Uh, where are all the ships? You know, where's the, all the activity of this trading uh, island, you know, that, that's known for trading? And it's like he's stand, sitting on the docks all by himself, no trade vessels in sight. And uh, I feel like that's a thing a young cartoonist does where it's like, well, populate the street. Let's see the uh, people and cars and all this stuff in the background. Uh, pretty fun to see. A few of these, like, faces, and, and there's a couple panels we saw earlier, they remind me of McFarlane. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely some cool influences on display there. Cyber reminds me also of the Mr. Hyde, which was the guest appearance in his issue of Hulk 368. That was who the Hulk fought. Very similar costume, design, hat, all of that stuff. Um, and the hat for Cyber is a pretty odd piece of his costume. Yeah, it's a, like a scarecrow hat or something, man. Let's jump right into part two. Uh, this is where we get some of the Droulet symmetry mm -hmm. borders with uh, with the panels. And super cool interaction with the lettering here. Yes. There's some good letterers who, who support Sam Keith's art on uh, on this series of comics. Uh, it's mostly, I think it's mostly Clem Robbins. Okay. He, he's on board on this chapter, and we can kind of, if we if we catch it, note you know when that changes up or if that changes up. But I agree. I think the lettering looks... Good. The lettering varies throughout these issues, mm -hmm. which is weird. Not the story, not the Wolverine story, but there'll be other issues with like a Todd Klein lettering where the lettering looks like it's two points bigger. Right. And it's just like, I don't know, it's kind of a weird thing. I don't know what causes that. I would think that would have been pretty standardized at Marvel, but apparently not. Yeah, man, you just letter at the uh, aims size you're comfortable with. Yeah. Okay, man, so you cut your promos on the dock piece, man. This is pretty well populated and pretty cool, man. I, you don't see very many infinity pools in, in, in comics. <laughs> yeah, it looks nice. Cool goons. You know, sitting there with that Browning 50 cal gun. <laughs> Doing what they're supposed to do when you're protecting that drug compound, man. Look at that gnarly-ass skull. I was I was looking at those skulls, too, going through here and thinking, like, where are you getting big, the bighorn sheep <laughs> halfway around the world? <laughs> because he has, I think, four of them on that desk all together. They look really cool in the drawings. Here's where we start to get these like squat uh, Richard Corbin type characters, man. And that hat, that that that's a Bernie Wrightson hat too, man. Great shading and, dra and drapery on that guy. But I mean, this is this is a cartoon guy. This is Von Bode. This is Ralph Bashy's Wizards. Like, there's a lot of weird 1970s yeah, totally. uh, imagery wrapped up in in this stuff, man. I love this uh, zoom in. With uh, we on the previous page, we saw Wolverine scaling a building. There's your full moon. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happens the other 29 days of the month. Right. <laughs> I can't believe how much ink is on like that face. I know, right? Like, you know, you stare. That, that's the stuff I would stare at, and it's these little marks that are like the beard, the shadows, everything. But whenever it's reduced and then printed on this newsprint, it just becomes this like inky mess <laughs> of a shape. I dug it. Yeah, man. It, it, it's real cool that he has these big long eyes too because there is so much black and there's definitely a lot of uh spreadage of the ink but those eyes they always stay clear and i guess we can say the story is that cyber is there to sell this drug to the highest bidder uh general koi is one of them he, he's one of the uh crime lords on madripoor and then of course the other one tiger tiger so that's what we're seeing right here is that first attempt at, at you know, pitching his product to uh, the highest bidder. And how about that? Starting to see what Cyber looks like underneath that costume. Adamantium. Badass. Exoskeleton. Sam Keith goes crazy on this, on that metal texture. I ate that stuff up. Never seen anything else like it <clears throat> before or since, man. When people try to draw Cyber, like, like they try, they try to do the Sam Keith version, never quite pull it off. And also, by the way, like, you know, we did that. Steve Rude Space Ghost thing. Like, this is Space Ghost with cybernetic exoskeleton. And we'll see some good examples uh, as, as we move forward. Speaking of great drawings on this page, you know, some pages might not have an anchor. That Wolverine. <laughs> Between him and Cyber, that's the page, man. Wow. I used to copy so many of these drawings. That Cyber musculature in the metallic surface, it would be like Colossus. Like, I would look at Colossus and X-Men and try to figure out, like, how do you draw it to make it look like metal? And then this was like, you know, the master's version of really taking that to an infinite level. Here we got the little photo stat 
you know, uh, enlarge the image a couple of times, man. Save, save a little time. Get a little bit more body hair inking. You do a lot of studying whenever you come across this where it's like, oh, what does this look like at, you know, full size or even bigger? You get to see what the lines are actually making up. I think that's a, a screen tone. You think? I do. I, I have some, some pebble pebble screen tones. And those would be uh, for, like, the um, blueprint guys. Man, the, the architects would use this kind of shit. It's a really good-looking cyber face. Evil. Yeah, when I was a kid, I was thinking, like, okay, it's Batman without the horns. Yeah, but more and totally. more, it's, it's, it's Space Ghost, man. Look at him right there. It's even that piece right there. Yeah, that flattened up head is totally Space Ghost-esque. <laughs> so, uh, Cyber fucked our boy up real good, man. And he's got some clawed hands. You see those claws right there? And there's some of that drug gimmick, man. Some of that narcotic is on there. And next issue, that's when things are going to really start getting fun. Look at, is this the inside back cover that has the Weapon X? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look at this. So this is a Weapon X cover that Keith had done for Marvel Comics Presents that wasn't used because Barry Windsor Smith is doing covers. You put those things on. Right. But really awesome to see him in a very different style than what we're seeing in Blood Hungry. You see like a much more human anatomy proportions for Wolverine. He's stretching for, for that Barry Windsor Smith uh, energy, man. Like he's, he's seeing those comics and he's like, fuck, like I, I can't, I can't, I can't be the goon. I got to try to stand up to that it's incredible the cross hatching in the background behind like all the bubbles in this liquid and then the lighting on his face look how he's lit yeah. where it's like upside down it's it's the equivalent of under lighting except you've inverted your figure right it's really impressive and on this glossy coated paper there is no dot gain like right. you're getting a very sharp lines reproduction super sharp lines yeah that's really cool boom let's go to 87 Let's admire that cover for a second. Not not very often you get that white cover. Pops, yeah. Good good use of negative space. When you hear artists talk about negative space and how that stands out, here's a good example of that. Yeah, all the good shapes and angles pointing towards our guy. And the first uh, little glimpses of the tatters, Jimmy. <laughs> the trademark. Look he gets better this. chapter to chapter, yes, right? He like does. you're seeing huge growth from chapter one to here at chapter three. Look at this, man. That's really, really strong. Beautiful page. Again, the tatters are showing up. All the textures. This story is full of textures, from the vegetation in the jungle to like his, you know, his body hair, and now we're seeing the costume fraying. It's very rich. When you look, when you like really study his anatomy, you like you you know that he sort of understands. There's you know three or four things that kind of make up the human body. You got like the muscles, you got tendons, you got ligaments, you got bones, you got little fat pads. And he has a way to sell you on each of them. Look at the page on the left and how the margins aren't there. Do you think they reproduce that too big? Or do you think he's just drawing like... You hear stories of artists... Like if he's drawing on, on white paper, unrolled paper... Right. Where artists will have like different margins on every page if left to their own devices. Yeah. And I wonder what's going on there. Because that stood out to me as being like... It's almost full bleed. Maybe it's off register a little bit. We have that margin at the bottom, but... It's big art. It crossed my mind that, that my, my issues were just uh, cut, cut weird, but if it's on yours too, then uh, that's a Sam Keith issue. One more photostat gimmick. All really strong. I mentioned, you know, we were going to see other animal drawings, pretty good looking cat drawing in there. And this is the part where he's kind of, you know, he needs his, uh, the, the, the mutant healing factor. It's not instantaneous, man. He needs to hole away like old yeller. Go under the house, man. Uh, the difference is Wolverine's going to heal up, get better, but not without a few trials and tribulations along the way. And a lot of tripping. We're going to see him with this hallucinogenic drug that Cyber has uh, you know, had on his claws. So we're going to see a couple issues of this, which really gives Keith a chance to shine. I mean, look, pink Cadillac, you know, <laughs> at a diner drive-in. We're going back to happy days, baby. We got a little, little, little a ragamuffin with a slingshot, a little wrist rocket, good tree <laughs> textures here. Uh, this is clearly Tracy Lords from Crybaby as reference. Uh, American graffiti type energy. He's referencing somebody there. K Fabers, who is that? I mean, man? that's Clint Eastwood, right? Is it's, it? It's gotta be. The hair is like different from one thing to the next. Adam Kubert adopts that Wolverine hair when he starts drawing uh, the big the Wolverine. box. That's like the box cut. <laughs> Love it. Love it so much, man. Yeah, these are some weird comics. Like, even Wolverine's face is just, like, so cartoonish and so distorted. 
You know, if you drew, if you kind of put that, how to draw a face next to that face, the distortion is amazing. And, and this is where we're getting some 70s vibes, man. Uh, some some Casa or Mobius or um, Carlos Esquerza or something. Like these these marks are real interesting. And they're not, he's using a different tool than, than we're used to with these ones specifically. He's getting into like pointillism and stuff. He is. And, and we'll see that a few times throughout this series. But, you know, there's that. And then this is like a dry brush, some of this background. It is a, it is a lot of different marks. And I think he kind of tones that down as he goes on and progresses through his career. But this one feels like every tool in the toolbox, we're going to see some some application of. Guess what, Jimmy? Cyber showing up to Tiger Tiger's crib. He's got an offer that uh, she potentially uh, can't refuse. Yes. Drinking Earl Grey, by the way. This uh -huh. is uh, tea of choice. <laughs> like, what a what a peculiar little bit. And here we go, man. Like I said, each of these chapter heads, I feel like they just get better and better. And they're so strong. I, I marvel at the wrinkles in the elbows, man. Yeah. I would, uh, whenever I encountered this, like the other artists that I would start to group him with, and it's not a perfect fit, but it was Mark Teixeira sure. and Simon Bisley. Because those two both felt like their mark making was much more organic than, say, the cross hatching of a, of a Jim Lee and, and Scott Williams. Yeah. And it just felt like they were coming from different influences and different, again, their styles aren't the same, but they had a different than the house style look. Yeah, I could, I could co-sign that. And here we go with the cartoony, man. The Let's get Freudian, <laughs> right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Big sauces versus little cocktail weenie mobile. Yeah, how bizarre. Love the figure work here, man. This is where we're getting uh, primo Sam Keith stuff. Like his ancillary satellite characters, you, you could stare at them all day in the max. And, and he's got that right here. I mean, that's a crumb body. I was going to say the same thing. It's completely coming out of that underground tradition. And uh, and he's out of San Jose area, I believe. So Or uh, Sacramento? Yeah, Sacra yeah, yeah. In any case, lots of underground comics, I'm sure, flowed through his hands. And he, he in interviews makes mention of the undergrounds being an influence. Uh, but yeah, man, we got the uh, the big dick contest happening right here, and it seems like uh, Cyber's getting a girl. This is the era of Wolverine where the writers were just piling on mysterious background information, and uh, it, it you could basically do anything you want with much. with Wolverine because uh, his mind is spun around. Who knows if these things happened in the past? But the way they what they're selling you with this story is that. They encountered one another in the past, and some girl was involved. That's probably the best summary, because I don't think Cyber was his coach in right. the 50s. <laughs> right. Some greaser high school. <laughs> Two pages of, of uh, throwing a little paper airplane to one another, man. The story itself is, is really not much happens in this story. Mm -mm. It, it's, it's funny to read this stuff and think like, this would have been considered a good comic coming out of Marvel in sure, 1991, sure. and yet there's almost nothing here in terms of story and Sam, stuff. Sam Keith makes it sing, man. A hundred percent. This hand is spectacular. Like, the lighting on that, that fist is just pff, perfect. I just realized that's a transition panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> weenie mobile. Cocktail weenie. <laughs> <laughs> and look at that. She's looking at that with hatred. Hey, hey Cyber, how about a pig in a blanket? <laughs> So they're, just, they're throwing a paper airplane with their little drug figures back yeah. and forth to one another. He rejects her offer and spits in it and then throws it through a glass window. That's a goober. <laughs> I don't want to know what he's spitting up. That's a gob, but, as oh, they man. say in old uh, British punk rock. Yeah, it's not a healthy sign. <laughs> and, and she acknowledges it. She's like, how, how does that work? Man, if you break a window with your goobers, man, like uh, I, I would notice it. <laughs> <laughs> here's another real muddy page like because all of the black on this mm -hmm. is getting on this page vice versa look at the cartooniness of that and and of course you would you would think of like bisley not saying that they're looking at one another but yeah. but uh it's just it's got that that flavor to it very cool cool panels yeah that page works it's another one of these pages like forget the grid you know we're just going to going to work here yeah sam keith does not use that grid i i keep it a stack of his books pulled uh sort of by my drawing table man to just i look through the stuff almost every day whenever it's time to compose a new page to just remind myself you don't gotta go kirby ditko 
Look at those claws, baby. <laughs> Look at that shit. We're getting into Kent Williams territory, man, with the with the hair and stuff. Yeah, that's a good that's a good reference point. We've seen a lot of versions of Wolverine in this story. That's for sure. Boom, let's get let's go to another iconic cover, I would say. Love this cover. That is such a hardcore badass. The coloring complements it. This was about as, as bullseye as you could get for me. Because the goal was always how badass can you make these characters look? Look at this little 70s gimmick, man. That's like a Drew Lay statue or something that would be in a heavy metal comic. Definitely something you would go to, like, on the boardwalk to the glass blowing shops, man. That would be in there. And we have switched letterings, I believe. Uh, it's not a, a letter I recognize. David Sharp. Uh, I think this is the one, too. Like, this guy does great work cool. in this in this comic. It's a bigger font. You know, the lettering's a little bit bigger than the previous installments, but the heck with lettering. Let's jump to him doing... A little Xerox work. Yeah. Wow. Talk about inventive... Uh, like I said, every trick that I think he could think of, he's pulling out here. And these are amazing. Like, seeing these figures where they, they repeat and distort off into the backgrounds, pretty amazing stuff, right? Yeah. That is not your typical-looking Wolverine comic. Yeah, it's really cool. So, yeah, this is the... He drew this piece... Xeroxed it twice, and that's what we're looking at here. This is like a way distorted version. I'm not even sure it's like an arm or something. If you've ever done this, it's a strange game to play. Yeah. You don't have total control. You mm -hmm. know, like if, if this is, and, and I don't even, I always wonder when I see this, is it definitely a Xerox or is it approximating that look? So like you would start with a piece like the, the head and you the, the scanner would start going, and then you would take your page and you'd start to move it a little bit. And so that's probably what you're seeing if that is a true Xerox. But a hard thing to manipulate, you know, like, it's fun to play with that stuff, but it's very, it's not that easy to predict something that you could use. Like, this might be something that you do 50 Xeroxes, and then you pick and choose and, and try to piece together what you're looking for, if that's in fact what it is. Yeah. I'm just matching up some little forehead marks with uh, with that, and uh, it, it, seems, it seems to match up. Like, when you start to get here and you get that wide space, like, is it distorted enough that that little white space is that? Uh, I think it is a Xerox, though. But, man, those those heads are amazing looking. This is the page where the letterer's kind of, like, doing some really cool stuff. Very Cause, strong. Because we're getting into, like, a cartoony sequence, man. I always thought that this would be so cool animated. Just these guys, like, going crazy with their arms. You got these, like, circle speed lines. Like, they're just chopping shit up like Edward Scissorhands, man. Then they meet in the middle, like, a couple of samurai. yeah. That's all good, all good references. And then, and then here's our ending. <laughs> yeah, I love this part. Can make sandwiches with this motherfucker, man. <laughs> Turn to baloney. <laughs> it's so fantastic. I always think, like, like this reminds me of Bill Sienkiewicz. There's a New Mutants that he does, and it's Charles Xavier, I think, being shot or something in his wheelchair, and yeah. it's a two-page spread. But also, that lettering, it's possible that Keith is doing that lettering on the board, too. When you see sound effect lettering, like, sometimes that is the artist, you know, working it into the art itself. And that seems like an integral part of the art. So, not sure who's responsible for it, but it works really well. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. I always like when you when you have, like, the negative space, mm -hmm. you just have some eyes showing, some teeth or something. The important bit. And here, here we got, like, he's starting to solidify his eye shape. <laughs> and nobody drew eyes like that on their guys man this is so unique he drew the best triceps too his triceps are just massive huge two-thirds of the upper arm uh-oh little deadline pressure this is a rough page he uh he says he smells cyber on tiger tiger and threatens to kill her <laughs> not his best moment he submits though Look, they're in the outback, dude. Yeah, that's a that's a different panel too. You know, this would have been a better panel. Uh, don't don't color your sky blue. Right. You know. Hey, go back one. Go back one. Yeah. yeah. What is that for a background shape? Man, just cutting up. Yeah. Just cutting up the, the separations. That's man. what we had left over of this piece of uh, magenta <laughs> and blue. Back to those ram skulls. General Coy. This is iconic to me. This this might be my first issue, of of this that I that I picked up, um, when we did the Marvel covers, uh, artist edition video, the there was an, uh, a facsimile copy of the original art of this, and 
uh, I I got uh, emails from distinguished professionals who were like, I forgot Sam Keith was so maniacal and shit like that, man. Good yeah. piece. Yeah, lots of textures on display there. Lots of his underground roots visible there. Yeah. Look at the perspective here, man. This is Mobius level perspective with uh, the way those bricks kind of descend into the uh, the background. He loves those round, round windows, too. We would see those in, I think, Julie's apartment in the Max. Well, you can't help but think of the tandem of, you know, you got your brute and you got your babe, you know? Yeah, even Wolverine's short stature and kind of wide base, there's a lot of Max, uh, you know, ha having a hindsight, having read Max, you do see some of those motifs here. Such a natural fit. And once again, just bolsters, like, those, those image founding fathers. And I know he's, like, you know, immediate, like, second generation, but they... They sort of took their heat from what they were known for, brought it to image it, in their own flavor. Of all of the uh, Xerox panel compositions, this is the one that like is just like, come on, Sam. Like I, I, I know you dig the drawing, man. You worked hard on it, but it doesn't even apply to like the dialogue or anything. This is when he starts getting into those weird. Yeah, it's like textures, a, 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 a thicker line for his cross hatching. Yeah, and just or, like he's not even hatching; it's like dashes. Yeah, and it's like he's got pea pods in the head, man. <laughs> I made I made note when we were looking at the Max with these like pea pod string beans in in his uh, forehead, his forehead textures. I always thought this was funny, where it's Wolverine's uh, not no costume on the upper body, but the mask is it's still good. on, and it's, it's like good. a weird hood with the wrinkles and stuff at the I love base it. of the neck. I love it. I love the uh, face and shadow with the five o'clock shadow yeah, with all like this that. crazy body hair, and and here we're gonna get into the Robert Crumb body pose. You ready, man? All right. Boom. <laughs> Keep on trucking. <laughs> yeah. I love it. One other thing that he would do a lot would give you that very pronounced, uh, like hip socket bone like that the femur bone like at the at the ball joint or whatever which is you know the the widest part of the human body if you're not an obese person and he always uh would um kind of draw attention to that you know he, here goes one right there yeah right this is uh this looks like he's getting maybe some deadline issues at this point these are far less inventive than some of the pages we had looked at earlier yeah not necessarily bad like that's pretty iconic and cool looking but uh, definitely not like the gonzo layouts that, that that are found in the first several chapters. Interesting storytelling stuff happened in here, man. We got Koi, we got Tiger Tiger meeting up, right? You see the goons in the background, systematically less and less of them right? as uh, the conversation is going on. Yeah, that is a good storytelling piece. And we should say Wolverine at this point is expressing fear of cyber. Like he doesn't want to go to this, this uh, you know, midnight drug run because he's afraid of this guy. Right. And that's what happened to the bad guys. Can't you see all those figures that he's sitting on? <laughs> Something tells me that editorial, you know, Jazzy John Romita was like, might we need to put a little shadow here or something, man. Maybe. Deadline, deadline stuff may have uh, been the reason for some of that shadowing too, but Peter David to the rescue. He lets us know what they're seeing by having the character state exactly what's in the picture. Marvel Comics. Look at that uh, uplighting right there, man. That's a good piece. It is very weird to me. Cyber in, you know, hat and coat versus cyber as a character. Right. They're so different looking. Yeah, it is almost like that Mr. Hyde thing. And once again, this is my demonic space ghost right here. Yeah. And I think you've said Corbin a couple times, Ed. Some of those faces, especially with some of the dramatic lighting, totally Corbin. Yeah. And Corbin would use these kinds of mm -hmm. hatch marks and textures. That is just a, a really great... There, there are several of these like close-ups of Wolverine scattered throughout this story that are just really cool headshots, face shots, you know, teeth coming out of the black shadows, good stuff. Really figuring out the cyber arms, man, and 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 just in the nick of time too, because we got to build towards our battle. Yeah, I don't know if Tiger Tiger's coming back from that, and the hardest metal on earth <laughs> getting taking one in the chin. That's going to be tough. Look yeah. at this iconic image, man. This might have been on t-shirts and stuff. I love the uh I love the blue tones with just that the uh with the white and those bright red eyes, man, selling you on the focal point. Yeah, so much is going on there. This image appeared somewhere because this was one that I would copy and stuff. So, it must have been a promo image at the very least, maybe used in some articles like a comic scene or a wizard or something. Uh, cuz I can remember this image 
it's just burned into my head. Like I know it appeared in some different places. He's all crouched. It's such a good Wolverine. There's another shot. You know what's cool, quick. man? Flip, flip back. Let's see that cover a second. Yeah. This is Sam Keith doing like two of Marvel's most popular characters at the time with uh, Cable and Ghost Rider. And again, like show off the metallic. Uh, you learn something with Cyber. Let's let's put it on Cable's arm. Yeah, these are good months, man, for Sam Keith getting two cover rates. Two yeah. cover rates on an issue. Good months for uh, for Sam Keith fans. Oh, he's just and building actually, a fan base. Dude, every you're getting week. four of them because this is bi weekly. Right, so you're right. getting like four of those Sam Keith covers a month. And we're back. It, it feels like whatever deadline issues he had, they're over because that's killer. Yes. Yes. Once again, that heavy metal magazine vibe with, with this kind of 70s imagery. Doing every sort of like, you know, pointillism plus the like the five o'clock shadow little dashes for hairs. You ain't dashing this page out. Really something special. Let's have a reminder of our Freudian gimmicks. Let's uh, do a little more Xerox machine work here. And a third letterer joins us. Yeah. Steve D. Surprised by that. Wow. <laughs> a lot of story to tell on this page here, man. And you know that's, what, man? That's your Chris Ware panels right he, there. He gets mad props because he knows what's important. We need to see the menacing, grimacing, good guy, bad guy. We need to see the standoff. We could get through this gimmick. Easy Cyber peasy. looks like such a badass, but whenever he pops his claws, it's it's uh, he's not winning the claw contest. When it comes, yeah, when it comes to the Oscar Mayer Winnie Mobile, Wolverine wins that one. Yeah, those are little like little cat claws. There's a uh, one of the dumbest parts of this whole story now begins, and it's between Tiger, Tiger, and Koi trying to figure out like how to solve this dilemma. Like their armies of henchmen have been killed. What are they going to do? How are they going to sell it to the townspeople yeah. to kind of keep keep their position in Madripoor? It's a lot of a lot of filler stuff. We're going to see this run, I think, through the the final chapters. Right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, here we go. Right, and 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 it's it's Peter David. Yes. You know, doing his his punny uh, dialogue exactly. bullshit. Exactly. When we really just want some more of this stuff, man. Let's you know, let's knock down a tree. It's neat to see the Sam Keith stuff applied to like a fight scene. Right. Because you never know about motion. You know, his art is so detailed. It's you don't know if it's going to work until you see it, and uh, and it works cool, really well. So it's it's a good setup the way this story like builds to those two having their big fight. Uh, this is some amazing stuff. Yeah, C- a couple things like like this is kind of like a good part, man, where they each like you know they serve each other some tea. Right. Uh, hey, what's what's that over your shoulder? What's that over don't your shoulder? Don't trust each other at all. Pour it out go back to talking but this sequence is super hard to draw like we got dudes on top of this truck a warren extra driving the truck (laughs) yeah totally cyber punches down through the roof a little dark knight uh little dark knight returns yanks homeboy out and then plops right down through that very tiny hole (laughs) and then you don't even know what you're looking at because it's like you know he's johnny x from the movie freaks like he has no legs or pelvis this is incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really strong. Yeah, what happens is uh, is Cyber uh, fell into the drugs or something, and he, and he got cut up. He got cut up by uh, his face. Not yet. We haven't seen what... I don't know why this hallucination is happening. I don't know if Wolverine is still sort oh, this of tripping. Is, yeah, this is Wolverine getting fucked But up. I love the distortion of like his hands and legs. This is the most... Car- this could be what the kind of version of Wolverine, very right. distorted. But that bull looks amazing. These circles make me think of Sienkiewicz. He would do this kind of... This kind of thing in, in black and white line. And look look at the uh, like hatching and, and texture on teeth. Like You almost never see that. Yeah, it's even like it's. I guess it's rain, but it almost looks like like his teeth are sweating. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's something all the alternative cartoonists would be jealous of. Oh man, sweat drops on his teeth. <laughs> Boom! Truck goes careening off that cliff. Thelma and Louise, man. Literally a cliffhanger. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Boom! There it is, man. The icon. Yeah, I was going to say, that's another one of those covers that you see reprinted and shown off a lot whenever you think of Wolverine and Sam Keith. I, I think, think this might be in that artist edition. It is, yeah. And I, I, I was going to say, I think I think this was definitely shirts and posters and stuff, too. They It's almost built for that with the white background. It's like, yep, just put it on the, uh, send it to the presses. <laughs> 
continuing this just wow it's incredible how you can make four pages feel like 40 <laughs> like edward movie man the shits are all just one hour long and you feel like you've, you're watching a godfather or something. i wonder too like who do you do you blame the artist for not, not making the stuff more interesting but it's like can you make this interesting it's the dullest conversation like talk about text that just hey editors yeah did, did you get paid for this issue <laughs> yeah man that's that's the writer trying to trying to show out a little bit all right, man, we're back to Looney Tunes, Warner this Brothers. This is what we're here for. Car- cartoon stuff, man. Fighting in the treetops. Yeah, look at that. That's a, that's a little bit of a pathetic uh, smashed up truck with like, yeah. you know, that little steam coming off. Fair enough. I won't argue too much with you on that one. But they are fighting from treetop to treetop. And uh, this is this is what the whole story is built around, this kind of showdown and Wolverine trying to get his back. And we see the wolf character is is still following along from chapter one. Yes. Watching closely. With a cat on his head. Yeah, him and the cat got together. <laughs> Look at those back muscles, dude. <laughs> he, he's, he's got pea pods in his back. This is the sequence. I think there was a wizard episode where we talked about this. What happens here is, you know, like you look at this and go, what, what's going on right there? Wolverine is biting Cyber's eyeball out is what's going on right there. Right. <laughs> it's hard to see, and I think this was edited, right? It's redrawn. Isn't that, yeah, that, that's what I, I remembered reading. Uh, but here he is in his mouth spitting it out, the patooey, but uh, bit his eyeball out. Yes. That's pretty hardcore. Hey, man, what else are you going to do with a dude who has a uh, an adamantium exoskeleton? Yeah, and he uses it whenever he just grabs Wolverine's claws and threatens to yank his skeleton out of his body. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's an amazing image. <laughs> Little wolf to the rescue. Good open panel, good silhouettes. Hits him with the jugular gimmick. Send Cyber Pack in, down in a vat of his, uh, his, his drugs, man. Right, with a major open wound in his skull that those drugs are going to seep into. And one of the things with the drugs is if you smell it, you'll trip. So what happens when you get that stuff in your bloodstream? Yeah, in a big dose. <laughs> this is what happens. I love that. Sam Keith busts out his uh, Fear and Loathing books, man. Takes a, takes a little page out of Ralph Steadman. Good pool, yeah. That's one of my favorite drawings in this whole, I guess, in all of Sam Keith's uh, oeuvre is, is that <laughs> drawing. I think it's really, really... Awesome. Fits the story perfectly, again, for a hallucinogenic nightmare moment. Really great. And uh, I think you're right on the money with Stedman. Stedman would be a common piece, I think, with lots of these artists that I named that are outside of that house style. Right. And it's very, uh, it's very, it's it's insane what happens with Cyber. They have to explain it in captions, but he basically runs into the bayou and just, there's no evidence. He he drowns. Yes. Giant metal dude out in the water. (laughs) Not a good swimmer. It's just a, a walking anchor. That's a good send-off right there. Good send-off image. It's really strong, man. It's, it's uh, you know, I wanted more Sam Keith when this story came out, and man, it delivered. Definitely put his name on my radar with, with this story. There are so many artists that we look at, and it's like, yeah, then they got an anchor, and they rounded their corners a little bit, and they started to fit in more. Maybe they got better at drawing fundamentals. Sam Keith doesn't. Sam Keith leans into Sam Keith. Great at drawing fundamentals, but also throw those out the window. That's the starting point. Right. And then you're going to get the Sam Keith experience. And he delivers it here, and he just keeps going. You know, like, you look at his career, just an interesting visual artist. One of the more interesting visual artists, I think, to come out of out of comics in general. And the fact that he's worked so much in, like, Marvel and DC over the years, it's, it's sort of shocking. Sure. You yeah. know, like, I mean, he's done a bunch of Batman books. Like, would you think that this guy, if he doesn't rein it in would be a Batman artist and he doesn't rein it in. He pushes it further and further, but still finds that audience. All you have to do, if you're going to be weird, if you're going to be interesting, all you have to do is be right and have an audience. And and deliver. And deliver on your deadlines. You got that audience. You don't even need to do that necessarily. Maybe not. Just get the fucking book done. But if you bring an audience to something uh, and you can retain that audience, the the comic world is your oyster. No, no, No sweat. Boom. Blood Hungry. Jimmy, such a pleasure to read this sucker, man. Fun to revisit it, because uh, I like these books that I read as a, when they were published, and then see them now. Uh, the Sam Keith stuff, 
it ages really well. We built this channel uh, from the start on, on Wizard episodes. I think it was like issue six was the Sam Keith interview. So it's like we pulled these off, showed them off a little bit. Uh, I read it, you know, two years ago uh, whenever we started the channel up. And uh, just cool to have a video kind of featuring the whole the whole saga and going through it piece by piece. I would be curious about how much Peter David wrote to uh, Sam Keith. Yeah. You know, because he, he does that fill-in issue... And then there's stuff in here that just really shows off his strength, like that cartoony stuff. Yeah. I don't know if you do that if you're not a writer that's thinking about your artist and thinking like, I know he can do this stuff really well. Let, let me put some stuff in here that's going to just, you know, amplify him. And I think the great comic book writers tend to do that. Yeah, for sure. You you always hear the com- about the conversation that the writers have with with the artists and, and uh see what their strengths are, try to just get to know them. What do you want to draw? I need I need you to be excited right. to work on this script, man, so that we can make something freaking cool. It looked like Sam Keith was into it. Yes, sir. You good? I am. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when uh, new vids are available. We each got those link trees in the description uh, below this video. If you're checking this out January 20th or later... Red Room Issue 1 is it available for, for pre-order. The Patreon is there for the early adopters, too. Th- three bucks will get you the archive for uh, all my Red Room comics. There's two issues up there right now. You can find me at patreon.com slash jimrug. You can find some of my out-of-print zines available there if you sign up. Uh, lots of art, lots of behind-the-scenes and process. Patreon.com slash jimrug. What else we got, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the link below this video to keep up with everything we have going on because, man, it's going to be a busy year, I think, Ed. Uh, you can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give him one more set of marching orders. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.